Okay, cool. So I'm going to give a presentation now, and I think it'll um, dovetail really nicely on um, top of the previous meditation. So as opposed to uh, the content, which comprise why the mind wanders, I'm more focused on um, when the mind wanders. Uh, so um, one task in which the mind wanders very frequently is a uh, focus attention meditation. And in focus attention meditation, participants are told to uh, pay, pay attention to their breath and only their breath for the entire duration of the task. Um, and this uh, creates an on-task state where internal stimuli are related to the task. So if they're told to pay attention to the breath, um, on-task would be keeping the breath in mind. Uh, but I don't know how many of you have meditated before, but meditating is hard. Uh, uh, and it's not hard because focusing on one um, stimuli is hard, but for because focusing on a stimuli for an extended duration is um, more challenging. So uh, therefore, we uh, tend to mind wander or to drift off to other things, uh, such as thinking about cute cats or potentially all the fun things you might be doing in Toronto on a lovely Friday or Saturday night. And it's thought that uh, uh, two macro scale networks distributed across frontal parietal cortices uh, subserve this um, on task versus off task state um, where the uh, default mode network outlined here in green slash blue uh, contribute uh, to exploratory cognition, uh, mind wandering, whereas the frontal parietal network outlined in uh, orange slash red here um, is more so uh, uh, involved in maintaining a task that make, maintaining that you uh, um, are on task. Uh, and so this uh, frontal parietal on task network I'm going to be talking about further today, and it's um, uh, thought to uh, contribute four functions in order to maintain this on task state. Um, and the two that I'm going to be focusing um, on, the, the two functions are first control signals. So the front, frontal parietal network generates these uh, control signals that bias information to produce controlled behavior related to the task. What this looks like is uh, if there's a higher uh, control signal. Um, this is going to correspond to a more vivid representation of the breath and mind. Uh, however, uh, a lesser control signal um, would correspond to a less um, vivid representation of the breath and mind. The second function of this network is um, this sort of metacognitive monitoring ability, and it corresponds to our ability to uh, check or sample what is on mind at any given moment. Uh, for example, I can ask you, um, what is it that you're thinking about right now at this moment? to which hopefully you would say, I'm thinking about exactly what the speaker is talking about, unless of course your mind has already wandered. Um, and this is also disassociated from uh, other monitoring mechanisms that kind of uh, occur naturally or automatically. So when you're riding your bike, um, you are monitoring your balance, but you're not explicitly aware um, of, riding, uh, of, of balancing while riding your bike, unless you wanted to point attention um, uh, to that feature of your experience. Okay, so um, in order to answer this question of why does the mind wander during meditation, um, I'm going to uh, construct a model and hypothesize a relationship specifically between this metacognitive monitoring function um, and uh, control signal, um, that representing uh, the frontal parietal network um, and having um, that system interact with the default mode network, um, this sort of off-task off um, generating network. Uh, so the specific relationship I'm going to posit is that if there is an internal metacognitive sample of what is on mind, the appropriate amount of control, uh, the appropriate control signal can be applied corresponding to on-task states. However, in the absence of a metacognitive um, monitoring internal sample, um, no control um, is generated, uh, which pushes um, the states towards mind wandering, um, which I'm going to uh, define as an explorative procedure um, which is active in the absence of an explicit goal. Okay, so to better kind of define these relation relationships, I'm going to use a uh, control theory uh, modeling perspective, specifically closed loop. The relationship is such that um, there are three main components, or uh, the first component being um, there's a dynamic system, D, so mental contents, internal contents. Uh, there is a controller, which is going to act on those mental context, on contents, the dynamic system in the form of an attentional um, signal or boost. Uh, and then third, there is uh, feedback, which determines how the actions um, have affected the state. And that error signal is used in order to determine how to best act on the following um, or subsequent time steps. All right, so let's jump into the model now. Uh, the first uh, component, the system D, uh, 
On the x-axis, we have time in seconds. And on the y-axis, uh, we have S of T, or the current state of attention, uh, where uh, larger values of S of T correspond to a more on-task state, lower values more on uh, off-task. At the beginning of meditation, attention to breath is near maximum. Uh, but over time, this is going to drift um, towards uh, mind wandering, a system equilibrium, which is in line with accounts that state uh, mind wandering to be this sort of attractor state, um, specifically in sustained attention um, tasks. Uh, so in order to remain um, on task, meditating and not mind wandering, the system exerts a control signal uh, where the amount to apply in a given time step is a function of the error. And the basic idea here is that um, if task performance is uh, um, acceptable, uh, very good. So in, um, for example, the beginning of the task is a high uh, value of S of T, a low error signal is generated. So low control is going to be applied. However, during mind wandering, there's a large um, error as you are off task. You're not where your uh, attention is not where it's supposed to be. Uh, so a high error is produced, which results in larger control signals. Uh, this relationship is going to take the form of a scaled sigmoid where there is a maximum and minimum control signal that uh, the system uh, or the uh, controller can exert on any given uh, time step. Okay, so now in ad uh, with addition, with the addition of um, control, instead of drifting to mind wandering, we now drift to uh, uh, this mean on task equilibrium, which corresponds to the most common phenomenological state during meditation, one where we're on task and we're working hard to ensure um, that we remain on task. All right, the second function then is this uh, uh, metacognitive monitoring, which has been previously defined as intermittent, but the details of how often it is that we check uh, what is on mind is uh, relatively unexplored. And so I'm going to uh, propose that um, the rate that we check what is on mind is uh, a probability function um, and similar to the control. Um, uh, function, uh, larger values of S of T. So um, when you're on task, there's a greater chance or likelihood that you know what is on mind. Um, however, uh, as you grow, as you drift further or closer and closer towards mind wandering, um, there is less of a probability of you checking or uh, sampling um, what is on mind. And uh, uh, this uh, probability function or a scaled sigmoid is bounded um, between a maximum and then also a minimum sampling probability, which is a non-zero sampling probability, as even when you are off um, task, there's still a chance that you're going to check or sample um, what is on mind. Okay, so now uh, with the addition of both of these functions, we can kind of simulate uh, the process of meditation here. Um, so at the beginning of the task, attention to breath is sort of at a maximum, but drifts towards a more steady state, which is a compromise between optimal task performance and acceptable task performance. On some time step, there is a missed sample, meaning you do not um, check what is on mind. As a result, no control is applied and we further drift towards mind wandering, uh, which simultaneously decreases the probability that you're going to sample or check on the next uh, state. Uh, and here we're going to kind of define mind wandering as any state that is less than three standard deviations uh, below the mean on task uh, equilibrium. And intuitively, I think this makes sense too. Um, as participants are meditating, they're constantly learning what is a mind wandering event. So anything that they determine to be further away from kind of where they're typically at uh, would trigger this sort of um, um, mind wandering uh, event. Uh, so then on uh, some... Uh, subsequent time step, there again is a, a sample. You do check what is on mind. As a result, a large error is generated, a um, uh, large control signal to get you back on task. Attention to breath drifts more to this, uh, to the mean equilibrium once again, and this process repeats for however long it is that you are meditating. Okay, so I've been thinking, uh, trying to think more how to validate this model if it is just kind of completely theoretical, um, or if there is a way to kind of make it more um, concrete and applicable. And while the ultimate goal is to uh, compare sort of uh, activations with uh, fMRI data, fMRI signal, I'm going to use button presses here on a task that I, I've already run um, to um, sort of act as a proxy for the underlying neural processes that are going on during meditation. So the data set that I have right now is part of an fMRI study, a larger fMRI study, um, and it consists of 22 participants where they underwent this focused attention meditation task. 
uh, there were two five minute meditation blocks blocks where they were told to um, press a button if they noticed their attention was no longer on the breath through this um, five minute period. Uh, this resulted in um, a um, a count of button presses, first of all. Uh, so this is averaged over two runs. Um, and uh, I also extracted the amount of time between each uh, button press and averaged that between two runs uh, and looked at the um, standard deviation of um, uh, how often um, the, the, or the, the standard deviation of the interval. This resulted in on average 11 button presses uh, over five minutes. Um, and an interval around uh, 37 seconds between button presses. Okay, so then I wanted to compare the behavioral data to simulated data. So um, I simulated um, a meditation run as the um, model depicts over um, 300 seconds. So equivalently five minutes and uh, a mind wandering event or this uh, button press was um, determined to be uh, any states in which uh, uh, any state that was three standard deviations below the mean on task performance, and there was uh, a metacognitive sample. I then compared uh, simulated data to um, uh, the behavioral button press data. And just to note here, I didn't do any sort of rigorous optimization. Uh, I just sort of compared the means and variances um, of simulated data to behavioral data until I got some sort of analogous um, results. Uh, and you can see that uh, with the current parameters set the way they are, um, it does a decent job of capturing both the uh, counts and um, um, intervals between button presses. Okay, so then I wanted to see uh, uh, or just use this model to potentially explain why it is that subjects might press the button more or less uh, during meditation. So um, why is it that subjects might press the, the button um, a fewer number of times? Uh, the first explanation could be that they're really good at monitoring. So um, they are uh, better at this sort of function of checking what is on mind and therefore not allowing attention to drift off task as much. Uh, the second interpretation was that, uh, and hopefully this isn't the case, maybe these subjects were less motivated. So they kind of spent more time in uh, the mind wandering state and so had uh, less um, button presses in total. The alternative explanation, or, or conversely, uh, why is it that subjects might press the button more frequently during uh, meditation is that uh, they uh, simply uh, weren't as good at monitoring what's on mind as a result drifted to um, off task more often or uh, more button presses could correspond to uh, they really cared about the doing well on the task. So any slight deviation in what is considered um, on task would result in a button press. Okay, a couple of other predictions that this model can make um, uh, is what percentage of time are people on task versus off task? Um, so um, here I decided the, the threshold for on task to be anything above uh, three standard deviations below the mean. Uh, and according to the current parameters in the model, um, uh, across participants, uh, there is about a rate of 10% of being off task throughout five minutes. The second thing, um, that we can look at is just isolating individual functions like the monitoring function versus um, uh, control function. Um, and according to simulations, um, uh, you're sampling the state 75% uh, of the five minute run. And then lastly, uh, participants typically, typically report that uh, there's this, it's a very brief period where they're unaware of where their attention is. Um, so to kind of match that um, as a sort of a sanity check, um, we can see that uh, there's an average of two time steps uh, spent mind wandering before there is um, a, a sample. So just sort of um, validating that this period of mind wandering is very short um, during um, focused attention meditation. Okay, so kind of to um, uh, recap here, um, in order to answer the question of why does the mind wander uh, during meditation, um, I hypothesized that this was due to the absence of um, a internal sample to check what is on mind. Um, as a result, there is no uh, control signal which uh, can be applied, uh, and this pushes the state um, further away from uh, meditation towards thinking uh, about other things such as uh, cute cats. Okay, and so just to kind of integrate this into um, 
existing theories of which we heard previously um, from the talk uh, before us, but I think is um, um, kind of the main benefit of this model. Um, to the two um, theories as to why the mind wanders is that it's a failure of executive function the, being the first. Um, so this makes um, sense on some level. Um, if there isn't control, um, uh, another process occurs of which kind of takes over cognition, this automatic process, and therefore um, it's a failure of the control system. Uh, conversely, some people think that um, uh, it's not a failure, but instead um, actually a function of, ex of executive functioning to find a new goal. If the current goal is not providing value, uh, then it makes sense that this system that is trying to optimize what you're thinking about is going to push you towards um, a new goal. Um, and so I think uh, probably both can be true. And it really depends on uh, these different neural interactions. Um, and I think this is where uh, kind of I want to go in the future in, is investigating how these networks are interacting specifically, whereas um, the, the salience network uh, perhaps might be mediating a switch um, between uh, sort of uh, uh, or deciding which goal is valuable and the, and the frontal parietal network is um, uh, sort of enacting uh, control, uh, but uh, 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 depends on kind of what the salience network determines to be a valuable um, goal. And I think uh, these models are sort of helpful to um, get at the underlying interactions between um, uh, neural systems. Okay, so thank you to my collaborators and thank you all for listening. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just curious. I read a recent paper by Mun and colleagues um, about the role of like brainstem neuromodulatory systems in like um, attenuating like whole brain attractor dynamics during meditation and like um, internal focus. And I'm wondering about in particular like um, bursts from the locus ceruleus and therefore norepinephrine like proceeding like refocusing on like internal thoughts or the breath um and I'm wondering about if you have any thoughts about how like um brainstem neuromodulatory systems might be incorporated into your model you're building here yeah that's a great question um I think it is um uh something that could be improved is just uh, I mean building a more comprehensive model that includes looking at uh, sort of um the complete picture, including these lower level systems. Uh, I think it's been shown that um, largely in these situations that they're help, helping to contribute to arousal, um, uh, sort of brainstem uh, type regions. Um, I'm focusing on just sort of the cortical interactions as that seems to be kind of where the control um, is happening. But I think uh, the complete picture would involve how is arousal um, from these lower regions affecting uh, or modulating the cort cortical act activity. Hi, hey. uh, great talk and Thank great you. research. Um, I have two short questions. First of all, um, the participants, were they um, trained meditators or not trained meditators? Because I'm aware of at least one research showing that the trained meditators are way better at um, um, controlling uh, external versus internal focus. And second of all, do you think that the duration of, so you had five minutes meditations, mm -hmm. do you think that that could have an effect if it was, uh, if, if there was a longer period for meditation? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, uh... Uh, these were all novices, uh, and I think that most of the work, um, or much of the work, is involved uh, in these long-term meditation med meditators because you get uh, kind of more precise periods of unawareness and then um, button presses. Whereas I think there was more contemplating as to what even is a button press for from these novices. 
Um, and that's why we got such a, a, a wide range in button presses from two to like 22. Um, but that's sort of the, the motivation was just to uh, get a general range for if, if complete novices are given this sort of task, what could be the extreme on both sides for um, many versus uh, smaller button, uh, fewer button presses. Uh, and then the second question, um, the duration of the task. I think that's that's um, something that I, I haven't incorporated that I think is necessary to incorporate. Um, uh, I don't like it at the, the first interval is usually very long, meaning that they uh, don't press the button because they're not tired. But as you get to five minutes out, they're pressing the button more frequently because they're more tired. Um, so I'm not integrating a, a variable like that into the model currently, but um, I should do that at some point. So thanks. Thank you. Is it, is it quick? It's quick. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if you have thought at all about whether you could give a normative account of this and whether there might in some sense be an optimal level of mind wandering. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good, good question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it, it depends on what, what optimal would be in this sort of context. Um, Cause it, it's optimal according to what you're optimizing if it is to pay attention to the task then it would be zero mind wandering but i don't think that's how the brain works it's kind of dealing with multiple goals simultaneously but yeah i think there could be sort of a um a, an opt a normative account for you know uh, when is it that you switch to finding a new goal uh, after some task isn't giving you reward something like that okay thanks yeah thank you all right awesome thank you for the questions let's move on to our next speaker.